150 billion tons of carbon emitted in the atmosphere uh, since those uh, barbaric days of the 1970s when you only had one blade. Um, uh, so I don't want to blame it all on them, but this illustration hopefully gives a wee, a wee insight to, um, uh, to, to what's happened in capitalist production. Moving on to more the global levels, what can capitalism do? Talk a little bit about individuals, some of the uh, national uh, developments, uh, regulations and taxation and such like. But of course, carbon dioxide molecules bob around in the air, they don't respect national boundaries. Um, it's a problem that has to be dealt with globally. So what's happening at the global level? Well, what we see is carbon dioxide molecules, carbon dioxide emissions, sorry, becoming uh, uh, just another pawn, just another bargaining token in the global geopolitical battleground, in the ongoing battle between nations and trading blocs and individual states. Since the Kyoto Agreement was signed off in 1997, global emissions have increased by a further quarter. As you know, recently the US is now coming to the table, albeit reluctantly. Uh, the points of contention here being, for example, that the US doesn't want to uh, uh, sign up to it unless their biggest economic rival in the future, China, has to. If the US is going to be handicapped in terms of its economic growth in the future, we want to make damn sure that China is as well. China counters by saying, well, wait a minute, all of that CO2 in the air came from you to start with. Mm -hmm. So again, where do you draw the baseline? How do you, how do you um, pull together an agreement when you have all these competing influences, nations, companies, industrial sectors, all trying to uh, pr pr protect their market and, in fact, increase their market share, if possible, during this shift from non-renewable to renewable economies. An example of this problem was uh, The Guardian published last week. Um, the Guardian reported that the UK is attempting to uh, make the, uh, uh, its investment in renewable projects overseas count in terms of the UK's uh, contribution. So again, that's up for debate. Um, who, 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 who takes the credit for that? Is it the people who invested in it or is it where the, where the plant is actually built? So there's all these sorts of debates and arguments to be fought over, uh, affecting every single inch of in industrial production and distribution. And the other big problem that I would say, that I would see in terms of relying on capitalism to solve this problem, is that it's all the relevant legislation and regulations and, and all the rest of it, carbon offsetting and, and these things. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to shift the market into a specific direction. And the market doesn't take kindly to being told which way to go. I'm not saying it can't happen, I'm just saying it doesn't take kindly to it. <clears throat> There's a couple of ways of looking at this. Now in the Al Gore film, An Inconvenient Truth, that, that many of you I'm sure have seen, the biggest laugh uh, at least uh, in the cinema that uh, I saw him, isn't something that Al Gore says, but a quote that he uses from a guy called Upton Sinclair, uh, who I'm sure many of you will know more about than me, but I understand that he was a Communist Party of, of, of the US, journalist and leader, in fact, I think, in the 1930s. Um, Al Gore, for some reason, I'm going to mention that in this film, it, it might not have gone down too well in the US. Uh, but we in the SPGB, uh, we're not fans, certainly, of the so-called communist parties around the world, but, um, but I know a good quote when I see one, and it is a good quote. It's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on him not understanding it. Now, at face value, the quote can be seen as an indictment of individual greed, deliberately ignoring something just because your salary depends on it. But I would broaden it and extend its relevance, relevance beyond the individual and to society at large, which I think, I presume, was Upton Sinclair's actual uh, intent behind the uh, quote. I don't know the context of the quote, I must admit. So I would extend it to the logic of capitalism, in fact. There are laws and statutes and regulations prohibiting you from using children in factories or putting them up chimneys that prohibits you from polluting rivers or from killing workers in your workplace. But there's no law 
that says an employer must make a profit. There's no delivery of profits to shareholders regulations. There's no Production for Profit Act 1974. And the reason for that? Because the whole system is already predicated on that to start with. That's what it's based on. Production for profit and delivery of that surplus to shareholders is the first and last of capitalism. So I would broaden this quote. It's not so much a criticism, criticism of human foibles as a criticism of economic circumstances. And I would, in this context, amend it to say it's hard to reform capitalism if the reform will endanger profit. Maybe not so, quite so pithy as Upton Sinclair's quote, but certainly true. Regulatory history is littered with examples of well-meaning pieces of legislation which were uh, evaded, watered down, circumvented, or ignored. And the big problem with relying on regulation to mitigate CO2 emissions is that in order to make it work, you're going to have to have an army of inspectors and agencies and policemen and certification bodies and auditors to provide some sort of veneer of confidence in the market, whether it's the carbon offsetting market or the emissions trading market. After all, at the end of the day, as long as you have capitalism, there will be incentives to cheat. Now you all know, uh, you, can, you can buy little gizmos that you can put on your electricity meter, a wee magnet that um, slows it down. Um, so, you have, so you pay less in your, in your electricity meter. It doesn't mean you're using less electricity. Uh, but you're, you're paying less. In fact, Scottish Power found out one of their, yeah. one of their customers was cheating them when they, every quarter they found that they, they actually owed this guy money. Bigger than bigger magnets. And it wasn't just slowing down, it was just going into reverse. <laughs> <laughs> now this is what people do for their own energy budgets uh, and their own energy bills. Um, because it's much the same uh, criteria that's used for a lot of the CO2 at the moment, the, the, the assessment of what some of these emissions are. You're not actually going into a chimney stack uh, and, and measuring what CO2 is going up a chimney mm -hmm. stack. Um, that's the job I do, by the way, is, is measure things coming out of chimneys. And um, but we're not asked to, to look at CO2. You measure it by looking at a company's utility bills and you work out from that. So I'm, I'm not convinced that there's not going to be a lot of people slowing down their electricity meter. Maybe I'm just being cynical. Um, but there's an incentive to cheat. You can bet people are going to be cheating. Last week, the papers exposed a, a biofuel scam whereby uh, people were taking uh, biofuel, I think they were, they were selling over to the US uh, and uh, getting it registered as being a biofuel over there and bringing it back over. It's some sort of complex arrangement that I didn't, to be honest, read the whole article, as you can probably guess. But uh, uh, this is meant to be a green product. But in actual fact, it's making this extra trip of thousands of miles by tanker uh, so that it uh, is classed as a biofuel um, and can be sold as a premium, uh, at a premium as such. But then again, um, maybe I'm being cynical about this. Maybe uh, with the right politicians in place, with the right leaders, we can. Uh, circumvent these problems and they can put their heads together. Uh, this is the G8, I think, although we've seen more than eight of them, I think. Yeah. Um, maybe we should uh, have confidence that confidence that with the with the, sh the immense importance of this subject that our leaders will actually be able to uh, do something about it and respond to the pressure from from the people of the world on this issue. Um, but then again Look at them uh, one at a time. Do you really trust these people? There's Putin. That's him actually at the negotiation table, taking his shirt off, bare chested. <laughs> That's the one I meant, Sarkozy. <laughs> and uh, my favourite one, the reason we get off the internet, uh, <coughs> Tony Blair uh, bringing peace to the, to the Middle East there. Um, and he, you know, just recently been announced as the, as the High Heechin, who, who's going to be overlooking the, 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 the global leaders and knocking their heads together to try and uh, make this thing work. However, if you do look at the CV, it doesn't make very uh, good.